Hi, I'm Carly with Bookish Pixie Reads. Thank you so much for coming back and joining me today, or welcome if it's your first time. So today I'm doing my November wrap up for 2022. Hi, so I know it is not November 2023, but I shot this video back in November of last year and I just never edited it. And I was, you know, really tempted to just, you know, be done with it and it's, you know, just in the trash, no big deal. But I keep thinking about it because there were so many books that I read that month that I actually really liked or that I may read the sequel to or so forth and so on that may get referenced in the future. And so I was like, ah, I don't really want to toss it. So I'm going to edit it and now you're going to have it. So you're going to get November 22 and then follow up on November 2023, even though they won't really relate. But in the future, things may relate back to this video. So there we go. But so I'm going to do my little like data that I always do at the beginning of every video, every video. So I read nine books uh, this month. All of them were physical and 11 authors. There were fi uh, five male authors, five female authors. I read nine fiction books, one nonfiction book, a short story anthology, and then one that's like a collection of letters. Um, and my racial diversity, I read eight uh, books by white authors and one book by a Latina author. When I talk about, about my books, I don't really do them in the order that I've read them, but I do them from my highest rated, and then my lowest rated, and then the middling stuff. Um, I get most enthusiastic about the ones I love and the ones I dislike, and then I kind of when it's lackluster, it's lackluster, but it's not necessarily bad, and what do you say? But so my first book of the month, my favorite book of the month, is the third in the series of the Vera Kelly, Vera Kelly, the Vera Kelly series, Vera Kelly, Vera Kelly Lost and Found by Rosalie Connect. This is the third in the series, very unclear if it's the last. There's nothing listed as a fourth uh, upcoming but there's nothing, each one ends where it, each one ends where it could be like a series ending. And so this ends and it's not like leaving you hanging for another book, but also there's no reason there can't be another book. So we don't know where we're standing here. But I've talked about the first two in other uh, episodes, other videos. I will link them in the thing. But I love, I love this series. I'm super in love with this whole entire series. Um, I actually got this copy from my favorite local bookstore, Blue Cypress Books. They're in New Orleans. They're used in new. And they were giving away, like with a purchase, a copy of an ARC or something if you wanted. And I saw they had this because like, yes, I love the first two. And now all of them are on my like wish list. I want to get them all in hard like a physical copy. The Vera Kelly, Lost and Found. So Vera Kelly, it's historical fiction. The first one takes place, it's kind of dual timeline of her, her present day in the 50s and her like teenage years, I guess in the 40s, I think. And she's a CIA spy, maybe it's early 60s, but either way, she's a CIA spy in, in Argentina for during the Argentinian coup, which is a thing I knew nothing about. And then she's also, she's LGBT. She's either a lesbian or she's bi. Um, and that adds a whole other layer to her spy craft. The second book, she becomes in New York City, a private dick, um, which also being a woman, men don't want to hire her, blah, blah, blah. She, there's a Dominican Republic um, leadership change. It's not quite a coup, but that becomes involved with that and then so that's and here's the third one i was very convinced because i didn't know what this one was about i just knew that there was a third one and i was going to read it no matter what you know what i mean and when i was so convinced because the second book there's a lot of talking about like um police raids on gay bars and whatnot and the fear of that and her girlfriend in that book is a bartender at a gay bar. And so I was very convinced that this book was going to be Snowball. 
I mean, was I ever wrong? We just skipped Stonewall, and now we're in the 1971, and we learn more about her girlfriend. So now they've been together for a couple of years. Her girlfriend was a the daughter of like Baron Oil kind of wealth in California, and then once she came out, they disinherited her. She moved to New York, made it up on her own, and well. Her family is falling apart and her sister makes some contact and says like, please come home. I need you, we need to fix this, whatever. And so she decides to go home. Vera's gonna go with her. Home is in Hollywood, California, expensive LA, super, super wealthy, California. And they go and there's all sorts of like, the dad's clearly now dating like, a 20 year old and there's all this drama there's maybe a commune happening there might be a cult happening that he the dad's now a part of this guy might be stealing his money his daughter is straight up max max is his daughter max is like hey dude this is bad and he's yelling at her because who's you know she's gay and he doesn't like it um he's never forgiven this unforgivable sin um and they're all staying like on the property. There's a ton of guest houses and they're staying, they were allowed to stay as a couple, but far away in this guest house. And Vera, Vera wakes up one morning, Max isn't there. She's hunting her down, can't find her. The house is so big, you get lost in it. She can't find her, she can't find her. And finally realizes that basically Max's father had her committed. And, but she doesn't know where, she doesn't know how to find her, because this that was a thing that apparently used to happen, was that family members would commit their homosexual children, and there wasn't a lot people could do about it, because if you're not family, and the family committed them, and if you're not like a married couple, what are you gonna do? And there's a lot of talk about, she can't go to the police, because they're not married, and they're gay, and the police don't like gay people and are very violent towards gay people. So she can't go to the police. And there's a lot of like really interesting, like what would, like what I find about these books, cause they're not always completely fast paced or whatever, but I always find them to be very realistic because what would happen in 1971 if your partner of like three years or more gets kidnapped, but you can't do anything about it. Because by the law, you can't be together. And then there's a lot of like getting the phone book and calling every hospital in the area and tracking down and trying to find. And I found that really interesting. And then she ends up on the Hollywood porno set at some point trying to find her. Um, but it's all very interesting. I really liked it. So it's, it's the other ones which are more political in nature in the sense of Argentinian coup and this Dominican Republican thing. And they have personal bits too. They're very kind of personal as well. This is very solely and this is very much very personal and also just very cultural. There isn't a lot of politics going on in that way, governmental in involvement in other country kind of things. Um, but yeah, I super love this. I super love this whole series. I kind of hope she keeps coming out with them. I mentioned it before. I can't find, it's not said, I think. I mean, I think she thinks a man in the, in the acknowledgements, but she could be bi, like we're not gonna do bi erasure and just cause you didn't say doesn't mean. And, but it does, and I'm straight, but all of it feels really authentic. This is authentic because I can imagine in any way. There's not, there, it, I, like, the, the police stuff and you can't go to the police. It's, not like, it's something I hadn't really thought about, but of course, of course that's the way it was. That sucks, but of course that's the way it was. And it's like, oh, wow, okay. But I don't know, I just, I love the series. I very much enjoyed this one. What did I give it? What did I write down? I get four and three quarter stars. The next book that I read was, it's a picture book, Adam and his tuba. They look like that. And <laughs> I'm really sorry, because I'm gonna butcher this. Um, the author is Slovenian. It's Ziga X Gumbach? I I know I'm pronouncing it wrong. I don't know what else to do about it. I'll type it in the caption. And 
illustrated by Maja Kastelik. It's uh, also I got this as an arc, so I really want to thank Net Galley and North North South Books Inc. Those who provided the 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 arc. And this will be published, it's not out yet. I think it was published in Slovenia, it's now being published in English. It's coming out on February 28th of 2023. So look out for this. This is really sweet and beautiful and darling. Um, and I guess this was my favorite book because I gave it five stars, but it's a picture book, so yeah. I mean, not, you know, that was dumb, but I gave it some five stars and I kind of forgot about it. Um, but the story is about, it's like a circus family, right? And it's this little boy named Adam. He's the youngest member of the Von, Von Trapeze family. And every man, every member of the family has a skill. Like his parents are, I think, trapeze artists and someone's um, like a tightrope. You've got a fire, fire breathing family member. They all are good at something except for Adam. And Adam plays the tuba very well. And everybody kind of ignores it. And once they, and he kind of feels bad because he hasn't been with the family. And then they kind of figure out that he can play this. And they're like, they, and they figure out how to work it into the show and into the circus. And it's very much about like, love your kids for who, and it, the family never doesn't love the kid. It's just sort of like, everybody's wrapped up in their own stuff and their own stuff is the circus that he is not involved in. It's very, let your kids be who they are. Um, and find, you know, and just love them for who they are and let them be part of the family in the way that they can be part of that family. And it's a very sweet story. It's kind of a standard story, but what put it at five stars is the illustrations. The illustrations are stunning. Um, yeah, so keep an eye out for this. It's going to be out on February 28th in 2023. So my next book that I'm going to talk about is called Murder by the Book. Murder by the Book, Mysteries for Bibliophiles. It's an anthology series published by the British Library of Crime Classics, and it's edited by Martin Edwards. This is also an arc, this was also an arc I got from that galley in Poison Pen Press. Thank you very much for this. I love this. I am, I put it on my wish list on Amazon because it was a digital arc. I very much want this. Um, physically to own. Um, it's a short story collection of golden age detective writers. All the stories, it's short stories, all the stories are about books or authors. So either like an author is murdered or a book is stolen or the clue is found in a book, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and because it's a short story collection, I can't really give you a summary of the book, but my favorites or the very first one, the very first one, it's about the lesson in crime, it's by G.D.H. Cole and M. Cole, those are pen names for George Douglas Howard Cole and I believe his wife Margaret Cole. It's the first one and it was such a, a fun way of introducing it, sucked me right in because it's tone. It's tone was almost very like sad, like almost meta, like meta before meta was meta. And I was just like, oh wow, this is really neat. There's another one called Malice Domestic by Philip McDonald, which is brilliant. Um, a Man and His Mother Law by Roy Vickers. Dear Mr. Editor by Christiana Brand, which was, I had never read Christiana Brand, and now I'm like, I have to because that one was so good. A Question of Character by Victor Canning, We Know You're Busy Writing, which is also is this author who is just very, he's like, I can't write anything because people keep interrupting me. And... So forth and so on by Edmund Crispin. But all the stories are really good. There was one long one that I got a little lost in that I had to push through. And there was one that I'm not sure counts. There's a still good story, but I'm not sure it counts in the guidelines they've given the series. Um, what's also fascinating about this, so I hate introductions. I like never read them. Or I do now a little bit, but I still hate them. It's maybe the best introduction just because it's it was such a great like they would reference other books maybe full-length novels 
you know, oh, this one was saying this, blah, blah, blah. I was just screen tapping left and right so I could look up these books and these authors that I've never heard of. So many of these were authors I had never heard of. And I so, and kind of because of that, and because I thought this was so good, I think this would be a great gift for a mystery lover. Because it's got all these, like, golden age writers who were really famous in their prime, but at least to my knowledge, have sort of fallen off a little bit. Like, they're not as remembered. They're not Agatha Christie, and they're not Arthur Conan Doyle. They're not, you know, they're not the names that everybody remembers. And so this is a great introduction to some of these authors. Um, the stories were great. I just loved this, and thanks again for the arc, you guys, because this was great. Um, I'm giving it four and a half stars. It was just so good. It was just so good. So the next book I'm going to talk about is called Clothes Pegs by Susan Scarlett. And to give a little backstory to this, Susan Scarlett is the pen name for Noel Strickville and who wrote ballet shoes and all of the shoes books. And if you don't know that, what I'm talking about, they reference it in You've Got Mail. But she wrote a lot of books from like the 30s onward, um, mainly known for her kids' books. Ballet Shoes is her most popular. It is my favorite book of all time. And this is a book meant for eight-year-olds. I read it when I was like eight, nine. Loved it, I read it every couple of years. I still love it. And found out in July that because she's also one of these, she was British, and she's, you know, wrote for kids, so there isn't a lot of, like, academia written about her, right? Because kids, kids lit for girls is not really looked upon, you know, greatly, you know? So there isn't a lot of academia. And I was searching her books, seeing, because every once in a while, out-of-print stuff comes back into print. Somebody picks it up and publishes it. Back when I worked at Barnes & Noble like 15 years ago, there were three books in America that you could get by her. And now there's a ton, and that's great. So I'm always kind of checking, and I checked, and there was these books that kept showing up by Susan Scarlett. And I'm like, who is this? Why do I care? Like, you're not her. What, what, why is this showing up? And then I found out, because this was not on our Wikipedia page, um, is that Susan Scarlett was a pen name that she wrote under to write women's light romance fiction back in the 30s. And there's like 12 of them. There's this sort of like small British uh, publishing house that acquired all of the rights for all of these and recently dropped them all in July. My library has them on Hoopla. You can get them from anywhere. You can get them from Amazon. Um, but so I made the goal is like, I'm going to read them all. I haven't decided I'm going to buy them all because I know I like her kids' books, but adult books are different and then they're all women's fiction, romance, money. Are they, are they going to start being the same? So I don't want to commit to buying them all yet. But I want, definitely want to read them all. So the first one is Clothes Pegs by Susan Scarlett, a.k.a. Noel Strickville. Um, original, this was originally published in 1939. So it's about Annabelle. She's a, um, she's a seamstress for this, like, um, like a fashion house. There's a fashion designer, and she seamstresses for her. And they also have at this place, they have like the models, very singing in the rain, where the women come out and it's, um, Miss Pettigrew lives for a day, they do it in that movie. They do it in a bunch of things where the women come out at Miss Harris, Miss Harris Goes to Paris, it just came out at the movies, which is also a book. They do it where people come to watch the fashion show and they all sit around and the women come out in the dresses and then they order the dresses and the dresses are custom made for the people. They're like, they're living mannequins. I think they actually call them in this book mannequins. Well, one of these mannequins, one of these models quits and they need another model. And Annabelle, our lead character, she's really pretty and she kind of fits the body type. And so they ask her to do it. And so she does it. And, and it's the story of like how this progression from taking sort of a lower paying job to a much higher paying job and how that affects her life and how that affects her, her and her relationship to her family. She's about 19. Um, she's walking out and like, she's not good. She has no training at this. And so a couple of the other models are, I think there's like four models all together. Two of the other models are quite mean to her. One model is very sweet to her and kind of works with her and helps her. And so like on one of the first shows, she sees this guy who's there with a girl and she sees him and she's, 
like he has to be my boyfriend and they do sort of get together and then they have the jealous ex-girlfriend and she kind of tries to sabotage the relationship and the family like she because of she now has her own money she wants to buy fancy clothes and the dad's like i can't control her anymore and and i mean this all sounds like way more serious than it is this is light bluff shenanigans um Carry models, rich girls, um, like I said, this was sweet and fluff. There was, I do think her boyfriend's kind of an idiot, and I'm not sure if we were meant to think he's an idiot, or just of the times and reading it in a modern day. At some point, he invites, Annabelle's a good girl, right? Um, and David, they've been going out, kind of. And he invites her up to his apartment because he wants to give her a gift. And she's like, oh, you know, I can't go up to your apartment. And he gets deeply offended by this. And I'm like, it is 1939. No single good girl should be going up to your apartment. And you know this. As a man of class and money, you know that actual good girls should be going up. Even, and it causes like, a big fight and big drama. And of course, they get back together. But it felt like this, like... I'm like, even at the time, right, guys knows that, know that good girls shouldn't be going upstairs to your apartment out in the public where you can see. Like, that's damaging to reputations. It's a whole thing. I was annoyed by that. That was probably my one, like, dislike. But the rest of it I really liked. It was funny. It was cute. It's kind of, it's relatively short. Um, I've mentioned it before, the furrowed middle bra genre. It's not really a genre of, it wasn't something that was named back then. It's something that, they, like, uh, a person is named now. And actually, the publishing house has, like, really taken hold of that. And they have they've republished all of, the, all of these books that kind of fall into this category. And it's kind of women's fiction, books written for women by women from, like, the 1930s to the 1960s. And they're all kind of, mm, I can't remember British as part of it. But so it's really, like, old school women's fiction. And what's kind of neat about it is that you're really getting a woman's point of view of what it's like to be a woman in that time period. And you really think they get what's up. It's none of this tomfoolery that you get when men write women, and even from back then. Um, so I really enjoy this, and if you really like kind of like old school and you want to kind of go back into like the history of, you know, not like history of stuff, but I mean like, if you want to go back and read something, if you like women's fiction now, maybe it'd be fun for you to read this from back then. Um, but I gave this four stars. I read another picture book, Anthony and the Gargoyle, by Joellen Bogart, and illustrated by Maja Castellet. It's the same woman who illustrated that Adam and his tuba. And the only reason I read this was I thought the illustrations were so beautiful. I wanted to know what else she had done. She had done this, and I believe this was actually just English. <laughs> it's not like a translation, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is a picture book in the truest form, as in there are no words. It's just illustrated panels. And it's the story of this little boy, Anthony. And I gave it three and three quarter stars, 3.75 stars, because I found the story a little hard to follow. And eventually, it's basically like, he has this, they live in Paris, they either live in Paris or they either live in France and are going to Paris or they live somewhere and they are going to Paris and they had been to Paris at some point pre um Anthony being born and he has this rock and then he goes and, the, and at some point when he's like five or six or whatever the rock hatches and it's a gargoyle and so it's really an egg and they got the egg from Notre Dame Cathedral and he wants to go to Paris to bring the egg to bring the little baby gargoyle back to Notre Dame Cathedral. And it's cute, it's sweet, the illustrations are lovely. And it's just like, I, I couldn't figure out, like all of a sudden he has this egg that had to, I couldn't remember where it came from. And I had to go back and I had to go through the panels a couple times and I was like, oh, that gray blob is this thing. It took me a minute. Maybe it took me too long, but it took me a minute. But that's it, that's the story. Um, 3.75 stars. Next book that I wanna talk about is um, Murder Most Unladylike. And it's the first in a Murder Most Unladylike mystery series. It's written by Robin Stevens. In America, the book is called 
Murder is Bad Manners, and the series name is called A Wells and Wong Mystery. The book's originally British. Um, I fell asleep reading this, and my cat chewed the pages. I didn't know they did. Um, or I know I can't do that before, so that's fun. Um, but it's 1930s, I think? Let's see. Nineteen thirty four. Nineteen thirty four. It takes place in nineteen thirty four in a boarding school. And it's Daisy Wells and Hazel Wong, which is cool because it's in England, and one of the little girls is Asian. She's Chinese. And we get Chinese representation in a kid's book that takes place in the nineteen thirties England. It's great. Um her dad sends her he grew up in a boarding school in England. He's sort of idolized England and English culture. His house in China represent like looks like an English like a rich English house. He sends his daughter there because he believes that would be the best education. And so Hazel and Daisy become best of friends. And Hazel finds a dead body in the school gymnasium. And a, te a dead teacher. And she runs, she runs out of the gym to go tell Daisy. And then Daisy and Hazel go back to the gym and the body is gone. These are like 12 year old girls. And so, because if you have to, Hazel's very, they're kind of playing up on, they even openly say it, they're kind of playing the Sherlock Watson thing, Daisy is Sherlock and Hazel's Watson, and the whole book is, is like the case notes that Hazel has written. And Hazel's like, we should tell the police, and Daisy's like, we can't tell the police, we don't have a body, which is very accurate. It's also the 1930s, and she's like, we are little girls, like the police aren't going to believe us, and we don't have a body, so we have to solve the mystery. And... I liked this and not as much as I hoped. I was really looking forward to this. I actually picked this up off of eBay, I think, because I wanted the British copy. Because um, there are differences in the American copy that are weird. Um, and I knew about some good read reviews. And so I really wanted to pick this one up. Um, this the British version in particular. But she, it's her, I think it's the author's first book because she wrote it during Nano Romy, the November write a book in a month thing. Um, and I know she, there's a bunch more in this series, and so I'm hoping that they just get better or she becomes a better writer or she writes more. Um, there's some really cute, not cute, cute's not the right word, but like you get that maybe a couple of teachers are like girlfriends, and you very much get the idea that Daisy might like girls. And I don't know how much of this is going to be picked up by like the age group that this is meant for. Oh, did I say this is middle grade fiction? It's middle grade fiction. Um, I don't know the... I don't know if I would have picked up on it at, like, 10, but I pick up on it now. But they're, uh, they go about kind of, like, here's our, here's our suspect list. And then they kind of, kind of go around trying to figure out who was available, who was close by, who, like, um, motive and availability to kill people. And I, I figured out the who but I didn't know the why. And I'm gonna do a little spoiler thing. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. I figured out the who because they ignored the who. They were so focused on like every other teacher and I was like, oh, I bet it's so-and-so because they ignored so-and-so. And that's exactly what it was. And that always kind of annoys me. I'm like, I think, and I'm under like, will she be better with that in the future? Um, and spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. But it is very kind of like, for a while, it was very just going to teacher A, what were you doing around this time? Or like, you're not, not blatantly asking that, but kind of just sussing out what they were doing. It's kind of basic detective work. And then later it gets around to a little more spying and sneaking and doing like more covert things. Um, so I thought this was cute and this was sweet. Um, not, <laughs> I'm such an idiot, but it's not like sweet, but it was cute and for the age. But what I find very interesting is that I'm like, when did we start having murder in kids' mystery books? Like, I, I'm like, and this is like a legitimate question. Either it's been happening and I haven't noticed, or, because I'm like, I'm thinking back to, back to like, I, re I grew up reading Bobsy Twins, which definitely didn't have murder. It was very much like, my baseball was stolen, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Boxcar Kids, which I'm almost positive didn't have murders, right? The Mandy books, which were Christian, 
Mysteries, which I don't know if anybody read. There were um, Lois Leopard, I believe the author's name was. Um, Lois Leopard something. So, uh, nah. Um, I, I can't remember if there were... I can't, I don't think there were dead bodies there, and I was talking to a friend about it, and she's like, were there in Nancy Drew? And I'm like, I don't remember them being in, like, at least the yellow back copies of Nancy Drew, the yellow spine copies. I don't remember there being murders there either. And I'm like, do you want? I mean, this is not, I mean, as a middle-aged woman reading this book, I don't care. As, but I'm wondering, like, if you're a parent and wanting your kid to read this. But also... And I was just starting to wonder myself, like, when did this start? Has it always been this? And I just don't remember. The yada, yada, yada. Help me out. If you, like, read middle grade and this is something you've talked about, you know, you've thought about or you've noticed, let me know. But another weird thing, and this is where we get into the American-British translation. Let's cover that first. So I actually checked out from the library the American translation, and I own the British, uh, the, Brit the original British. And... Some of it is so bizarre in the switches. However, I didn't read the whole book. I read, I read the first three chapters. I read like chapter one, chapter one, chapter two, chapter two, chapter three, chapter three, and then beyond that, I just read the British version. And except for when there were like specific moments where I was like, oh, I wonder how this covers that, I would go look. Um, someone wrote in one of the Goodreads reviews, they're like, in a post Harry Potter age. I thought we would be good at not having to explain what like a first year is and a third year or what a headmistress is. Like, don't we all know this? All these kids this age, because this was published in like 2014, like all these kids know what this stuff is. And in the British version, it just headmistress, the ma uh, a master, a mistress, the dorm, you know, like, or the common room, blah, blah, blah. In the American version, I think they just change it to teacher. He's my teacher, she's my teacher. They explain what some of this stuff is. And it's like, when do we allow for context? Like there's at some point they sneak desserts. They get like male desserts from family. And in the British version, they have a bake wall tart. And I think in the British version, in the American version, they just say, oh, she got a chocolate cake. And I'm like, can't you just have left it be Bakewell Tart? Like, yeah, maybe they don't know exactly what it is, but in Harry Potter, on the little cart in the beginning, when the little cart lady in the train brings in their stuff and they have Cornish pasties, pasties. I didn't know what that was till two years ago when Great British Bake Off made it, and I read these books when I was 13. Like, but I got that it was a treat that was nice, and you got it on a cart and a train. Like, do we really need to explain everything? At some point, somebody wakes up and puts, um... It was a brand, I can't remember the brand name at the moment, but for us, we probably heard of it, I have heard of it, but a brand of like hair cream that you put in your hair. And, but by context, you know it's hair cream. They didn't have to go change the name, and maybe for that there was like a trademark issue, I don't know. But it just felt like there was a lot of weird explaining of things. Changing things that seemed unnecessary, and then explaining of things, but then, this is where I really want to have like an intellectual conversation about is that in the British version, there's a character, they talk about how the school has ghosts and the most recent ghost, which is only about a year old, was one of their classmates who committed suicide. And this is kind of like what you consider like a cozy mystery for kids. It's not like a hard boil, you know, drama, it's not supposed to change the world. Um, and this, a kid committed suicide. She jumped off the balcony of the gym or something. And and the kids are very kind of flippant. They're like, oh, that girl who like, killed herself last year. And they're kind of very kind of flippant about it. And I was like, oh, that's odd. And I don't know if I was a mother, I'd want my kid reading about suicide in such a light way. And they mentioned it a couple times, and I was wondering, I'm like, this better come back as part of the story, because this is very unnecessary, and it does. But I flipped through the American version, and she, in the American version, they take that out. She fell. She fell off the balcony. And what was so odd is that, like, on the second reference, when they bring it back, because someone, like, forgot. They're like, you know, she killed herself. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. 
But like the way the conversation, they change it to she fell, but it's like they didn't change the rest of the conversation. And the rest of the conversation works well with the suicide, but not with the falling. And it was just like, oh no. Like, it was just like, why did y'all? But I feel like I would actually approve of that. Like, I don't know how I feel about suicide being in like a 10 to 12 year old age group book that's treated as sort of a light, a lighter, a fluffier thing. I mean, yeah, there's murder, but I mean, because mysteries have murder, you know, you know what I'm talking about. If you know, you know, you know what I think. Um, I thought that was odd. I would really love to have a conversation about that with somebody. Leandra, I'm looking at you. Um, but yeah, so I'm giving this one a three and a half stars. I probably will eventually get to the second one. Because like I said, I think there's a lot of potential here. There's a lot of interesting things going on here. Um, I just, it's felt like a first time kind of novel. And clearly if it's being written during it, oh, Romy. Yeah. Um, but I'm really excited to see where it goes. And I think it, it, it could actually really get better. So my next book is called Here We Go Again. My next book is called Here We Go Again, and this is sort of the oddball of the bunch. Here We Go Again, Unpublished Letters to the Daily Telegraph. Uh, and I got this as an art from the Galley and Quarto Publishing Group. Slap dash white lion. I'm, gonna, I'm guessing that's a subset. But it's edited by Kate, Kate Moore. And apparently the Daily Telegraph does this every year. And this is like volume 14 or something. And it's letters to the editor that didn't get published that are really weird or funny or that they kind of were like, oh, this is funny, but we don't need to publish it. And it's just, that's all it is. It's just collections of like little snippets of letters about, and they kind of have a categorized by entertainment or politics and so forth and so on. And it's um, economy, COVID, um, cause this would have been from the year 2022 and it's out already. Uh, but I thought I was going to love this. I'm only giving it three stars. You have to be such, I, really, I thought I was an Anglophile. I am not. Like, I think you have to be either actually British and live in Britain, or such an over-the-top Angliophile in all aspects of British society, not just like entertainment, to really appreciate this book. There's a lot of stuff that I, I mean like COVID's COVID, we all had COVID, um, but there was a lot of like, their their very specific politics that I'm like, I kind of get, but I don't really get, I don't follow that close, you know what I mean? But I'm giving that one three, three stars, it's already out, there we go. I didn't say because I had the arc of the Vera Kelly book. It's out. You can get that anywhere. Um, the next book I'm going to talk about is Bait and Witch. Ah, like Bait and Switch with Bait and Witch by Angela M. Sanders. It's the first in a new series by, um, called The Witch Way Librarian Series. It's like a magical cozy mystery series. I read this with the Crafty Cozy Mystery Chat. They're on Instagram. They kind of pick a book a month. Um, and then they want to talk about it. Like they have a group message and they talk about it. They don't know I do this. I probably shouldn't say this. They're nice people. They're all a little bit very cupcakey. Like if you wanted to join the group and you wanted to have an actual chat about it, about what you liked or what you disliked, they all love everything. They all want everything about everything. And then I feel like I'm like the downer where I'm like, well, this didn't make sense. And this didn't make sense. And they're like, well, I just wanted to read it and be happy. And I'm like, yeah, I do too. But I actually kind of want things to make sense, you know. But so that's the kind of group it is. And they're all very nice and I'm being mean. But um, so it's a magical librarian series. So Josie, she's our lead character. She works as like an archivist in like, the Congressional Library, the Library of Congress in DC. And she overhears some bad stuff go down. And she reports it. There's gonna be like a, like a trial sort of situation. And she is very afraid for her life because her, the other guy that overheard it with her, he kind of disappears. She's very convinced her life's in danger. 
And so she gets on a plane and had, she gets a job as a librarian in a small town in Oregon. She gets on a plane and gets there. And in this library is this beautiful old house that has been converted to a library. And it's been in the community for eons and it was donated. It's sort of like an old um, company town. It was a mill town. Everybody who lived there worked there. The mill burned down. The economy took away like years ago. The mill burned down years ago the, and they didn't build it. The family who ran it left. The only person who was good in this family was the one who made our house into a library and she donated it to the town. Um, the economy is really taking a downturn. All the young people leave. So it's kind of stuck with like the older, the middle-aged, the older people who have no reason to leave, but also life's not great. And she gets to town where basically they're going like, I can't believe you got hired for this being that we're closing the library in like a month. And she's like, what? And in the documents for in the like the um in the writing and the will and how it was donated and like you know the bylaws or whatever it says that it can be take it can be made into something else it, it can be the library can be it cannot be a library it could go through the process of not being a library and become something else if it's better for the community but there are zero guidelines that say what make it what benefits the community like how do you decide is that a financial thing is it a community feeling is it like what's that decision that is not laid out so it becomes this fight of the library has like a board of seven members and which is beyond me is that one of the board members is the real estate agent who's trying to sell the place to there's this couple that want to make it into like a retreat like a spiritual hippie dippy retreat and tourists can come and it could really revitalize the community and there's this whole thing where they even talk about that, like, in the laws, in the bylaws, you can't have a person who wants to do this without being on conflict of interest. But then that is never brought up to the judge who's in charge of this case. It's super weird. There's a lot of weird inconsistencies with this book. Like, if you get into, I had a conversation with a friend, and I got into, like, the nitty gritty of it, and she's like, wow, that's terrible. And I was like, it didn't feel that terrible while <laughs> reading it. Um, and, like, I enjoyed the reading it, but I was just like, what? Um, and then... In the end, with the library itself, with the library itself, the solution to what happens with the library, because they give her in, and they're like, what can you do to help us? And she kind of goes to the files and writes down, like, how many classes have we had about language, like, learning a different language, and how many um, knitting groups have we had meet, and how many, like, just what have they done for the community? And she draws up all this stuff. And then the solution, I won't say what the solution is, but the solution, either way, could have been done without her and essentially was done without her. So I'm like, what was the point of any of that? And I think it's sort of a setup, like future books, but also you could have just started that way. Like I don't, just start that way. I don't know why this, this was a whole bunch of stuff that no one needed because you could have done this without her. I mean, you did do it without her, but she could have done it before she got there. Um, but she gets to work at this library and essentially within like the first day there's a dead body in the woods. And so that's who the mysteries revolved around, revolve around. And she also discovers that she's a witch. Like that her grandmother was a witch and everybody kind of has like, are you a nature witch or whatever, but she's like a book witch. And the books in the library kind of speak to her. And when um, people start coming in, pat when patrons start coming into the library, she would kind of be like, she'll just know by looking at them, this is what you need. It's not even what they were coming in for, but this is what you need. And she gives them, and then they all come back and like, wow, how'd you know? And then she tries to shut it down. She kind of realizes that like the power, it's a lot of power and it can cause destruction and bad things. And she tries to shut it down and then she loses that gift. And eventually she decides she wants to keep it. And I feel like I'm going to get into too much more than that. It gets spoilery. There's a hot next door neighbor who was a member of this family of the mill town. Everybody kind of hates him. He comes back. He's hot. Blah blah. Um, there's just weird stuff that doesn't make sense. And if I say them, it ruins the story. So I'm not gonna say them. It's just there's a lot of like. At some point, I think I even said, "I'm like, this isn't a mystery." She doesn't solve it. Somebody else, they, you know, the person who admits it to her. And I'm like, book number one, you can't even solve it. Like really. Um, yeah, 
this, I mean, like, I gave it, like, three, three stars. It's just sort of kind of, like, it's, it's a clever idea. It's just the, the thought, the actual doing of the idea is not great. Um, so three stars. I know it's a series. I think there's at least four or five out. I may get to it. I may not. It, it's not something I'm like, I'm never reading this again, but I'm not like dying to pick up the next book. We'll see. So my next book, Oscar Isaac, I love you. I love you very much, but I have to tell you, this is not good. So, or it's not good to me, I should say. Um, so I don't know if you've heard, but Oscar Isaac produced a comic book, a graphic novel called Head Wounds, Sparrow. And it's written by Brian Boccolato, the stories by Robert Johnson and John um, Alvey. And it was developed by Oscar Isaac, the actor, I didn't say that, the actor. He played Poe Dameron in Star Wars. He's Moon Knight in Disney Plus. He was the dad in June, like, um, but it was developed by Oscar and Jason Spire. And so this deal, the deal of this is, is like Oscar's childhood besties like had this story and if this was a movie oscar would be the producer of the movie he didn't write the movie he didn't direct the movie he didn't do this but he like they him and his wife their production company got a kickstarter to help get this going i'm sure he like had connections and got it put in the door and got it funded and got it made so oscar didn't write it but he was heavily involved with getting it out there so i can't even tell you what this is about I read this and I was so confused pretty much from day one. And so I'm going to read you the Goodreads description of what this is. So I think I was like halfway through and I went, oh, I think I kind of get what's going on, but I don't know how to remotely explain this to anyone. What kills you makes him stronger. A detective with a higher purpose feels the pain and wears the wounds of those he's failed to protect. And there's only one way to stop the bleeding, vengeance. As a divine battle of good and evil between the angels and demons rages around him, can this crooked detective follow the straightened arrows to seek justice? Or will he just save his own wounded skin as the fate of humanity hangs in the balance? So the main character is this, it takes place in New Orleans, which is kind of cool, and the art, because I'm from New Orleans, and the art's really cool and pretty. Um, pretty, but I mean, it looks like New Orleans, and it felt like New Orleans. Crooked cops. The, the, the main guy looks like Oscar. Sometimes he looks like Pedro Pascal, who's Oscar's best friend that crosses in between. He's this crooked cop. He's cheating. Um, he's having an affair with his partner's wife. Um, and he starts having his partner's husband, Her his partner gets killed. And he starts going through, almost like it's a wonderful life, but not, I mean, I guess not at all, but he starts feeling the wounds of people who he could have helped. Like if he didn't help somebody, someone gets shot, he feels that bullet wound. And no one else can see it, but he can see it, he feels the pain of it, and it keeps happening. And then eventually they're all like angels and demons or whatever, it's weird, I don't know. And there's like a fight. And by the end I'm like, oh okay, I could see this being a series, I guess, but I still didn't really know what was going on. And like there was some like mythical creature that showed up, I don't know, it was very blobby. And, and I was like, what is this? I don't even know what this is. And it didn't even pay just realize it was like a demon or something. And I was like, oh, I was like, this, this is weird. But that's two stars. And so that's my book talk for November. And so if you've read any of these or if you're, part, you know, if you're thinking about reading them, let me know. Let me know what you thought about the stuff you've read. Um, thanks for hanging with me. And I hope to see you soon. Bye.